Well, hello and welcome to MBCF at Home. We're so glad that you could join us. Today, we've got Bill Nesbitt sharing with us, kicking off a brand new series. But before we get to that, uh, why don't you grab yourself a cuppa and uh, join us back here in a second for the rest of our service. Well, great to have you with us tonight for our online service. We uh, pray that these online services enable you to feel connected to what we're doing here at NBCF. And whether you're watching uh, further uh, afield or whether you're watching from locally, uh, we're just so glad to have you with us. My name is Neil Thompson, and together with my wife, Jo, we uh, lead the fellowship here. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. So why don't you um, drop us an email uh, and we'd love to just uh, find out who you are and who's watching with us. But we, we pray this blesses you today. So as I said, today we're kicking off a new series called A Living Hope. We're going to be exploring a little bit more about what it is, what is the hope that God gives us and, and what is this new hope that we've been birthed into. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be exploring this theme. But today, uh, Bill Nisbet is going to be kicking off our new series. So uh, stay tuned for that. Before we do that, and before we have a time of worship, I just wanted to share uh, just a verse for our encouragement today. So um, if you want to look it up yourself, it's in Matthew 11, and it's verse 28. And I just want to read these words and then pray for you. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I just want to pray for you today, just for that sense of rest. Wherever you're at, where the challenges are in life, Jesus comes and says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. So I just want to pray that rest over you as we go into a time of worship now. So Jesus, we pray for that rest to rest upon us. Life throws us challenges and is difficult at times, but we pray for that rest that you offer us to be a reality in our lives. Let's now worship together.
I was thinking about Dougie as I prepared this uh, talk today um, because we're going to be looking into, it's the, it's the first letter of Peter in the New Testament. And I was thinking of Dougie because this letter, uh, 1 Peter, was written to the believers in Turkey, in the northern part of Turkey. And because I'm not great at geography, I, I actually wondered, well, is, is that where Dougie is? Is that where he stays? And lo and behold, out of the, the blue, or out of the, as we say in Scotland, out of the grey, the phone went and it was Dougie. He said, I'm going to be there on Sunday. I said, wow, that's great. All the way from Turkey. And it's great to see Shan as well. Uh, Nice wave there. So, um, so it's really good to, to have them uh, among us uh, today. And uh, today we're, we're launching a, a, a new series uh, entitled Living Hope. Living Hope. Uh, what does, does that image speak to you at all? Um, it, I hope it does, uh, of nurturing something which is within, and especially if we go through difficulties, we're nurturing that living hope that's been placed within us. And uh, th this is partly to do with who we are as a people, our, our mission statement, if we can have the next, uh, the next slide. Um, our aspiration is to be a Jesus-centered family both living out and giving out hope. Hope is a big thing in Scripture. And there's, uh, there's an alarming lack of hope across the globe these days. People are crying out for hope. So we aspire to be a Jesus-centered family. And it's, it's, I, I'm really glad that that phrase, Jesus-centered, is in there. We're not doctrine centered. We're not even worship centered, as important as those things are. We're not even kingdom of God centered, as important as the kingdom is. We're Jesus centered. And a posh way of saying that, we could say we, we want to be Christocentric with Jesus at the center of things. So if you have your Bible, if you could turn to 1 Peter, it's uh, New Testament, going towards the back of your Bible, towards the maps, 1 Peter, and on screen there's uh, a map, there's Turkey, and the, the places in red, there's five provinces and these were part of the Roman Empire at the time. So Peter is writing to believers in different provinces in Turkey. And it, it's not a, an easy time for believers. And the five provinces you'll see in red are Asia, Bithynia, Galatia. You'll know that Paul also wrote to the Galatian believers, Galatians. Cappadocia and Pontus. And so those are the areas, that the, the, the churches in that area where Peter was writing to. They were Roman provinces. We're talking about the time where the Roman Empire holds full sway. And in the lives of these believers, there are various trials and suffering. So when we get to the reading here, and it mentions living hope, Peter didn't just mention the phrase living hope for the sake of mentioning it. He said it because it spoke right into their life circumstance, which was difficult at the time. And not long after Peter wrote this letter, uh, he lost his life. Can you imagine living in a, a culture, if you're a, a tradesperson, a tradesman, where people no longer come to you to get business, to get work done, because you're a believer. Imagine if your next door neighbor 
refuse to talk to you because you're a believer. How hard would that be? That's why the church needed each other. That's why God gave us the church so that in those difficult times we can draw from one another. So that's the, the, the context of 1 Peter. And we're going to read now from uh, chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And this is from the NIV. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Just to note the Trinity, if you can see verse 2, there's Father, Son, and Spirit. Whatever Jesus does, he does along with the Father and the Spirit. So there's a kind of Trinitarian feel to that verse. We continue. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. And then we continue. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I used to work in the jewelry business and pawnbroking, would you believe? And sometimes people would bring gold rings in. To, they would pledge their, their ring and then they would receive money for the or a loan for what they've deposited. And I would often have the job of testing the gold just to make sure it it was it was kosher. Gold that doesn't have a hallmark, you just go, well, is that real gold? And sometimes out of sight of the customer, well out of sight of the customer, I would take a file and I would make an incision in the ring and pour in, I think it was nitric acid. No, I didn't show the customer this. And if it turned green and began to bubble up, I knew this wasn't gold. This wasn't the real thing. And there's something of that in this passage that we've just read. I didn't plan to say this, but it's there. Uh, gold, our faith is of greater value than gold. What, what's, the, what's, what's the most, uh, what's the thing on this earth that has the greatest value, diamonds or gold or whatever? Our faith is extremely precious. And the idea being here that when our faith is tested, it doesn't go all green and bubbly, but we hold through. And Peter says here in these verses that we've been given new birth into two realities, two things. I, I, came, I came to new birth in 1971. I had long, long hair. I was a hippie and uh, I lived for music. I worshipped Gibson guitars. I, but I was born again. And when I was born again, I was born again into a whole new existence. And the same is true for you. Receiving new birth means like a newborn baby, you, you, not that I have any experience of this, but you, you, you come out of the womb, you're birthed into a whole new world. And being born again is like that. You're born again into 
a completely new environment. And Peter says, this new environment has two things, two qualities to it. First of all, we're born again into a living hope. And that's the title of our new series. We're born into a living hope. And secondly, we're born into an inheritance. And this inheritance is indestructible. Never perish or spoil or fade. There's a quality there like the gold that's tested. It comes through. So we've been born again into a living hope and into an inheritance. There's another way of rendering this verse, which is, again, the NIV, but it's the reader's version, which I think is uh, to help when, when, when the, the, the scriptures are taken into uh, non-English speaker, English speaking uh, lands, where the, the, the rendering of the words is fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Give praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth and a hope that is alive. A hope that is alive. It is alive because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Some wonderful verses. And, you know, we, in, in our, if, if we say that we're part of the kind of Protestant church, the focus really has been on the writings of Paul. Uh, we'll all be fairly accustomed to hearing sermons on letters that have come from Galatians, Ephesians, all those letters. And here in this uh, letter from Peter, there's a, a different kind of feel, different slant, and it's a good slant, and it's, it's, it's a, a good uh, thing to read the letters of Peter. And I was thinking of a possible definition of hope, and you might think of a better definition, but here's what I came up with, that hope is a confident expectation of the goodness of God. A confident expectation of the goodness of God. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope, biblical hope, is not whistling in the dark. Biblical hope is not hoping for the best. It's not crossing our fingers. It's not optimism, although I like to be around optimists. It's not a false hope like Scotland winning the World Cup. That's a false hope. Have you found that when you go through difficult seasons in life, that false hopes get burned away and you land up not just believing in your beliefs, but believing God? False hopes get burned away and we're left with what really, really matters. Biblical hope is not false hope like the wee boy who found a piece of straw in his house and said to himself, Dad's got me a horse. No, just a piece of straw because hope has to have an evidential base. That's why Peter says, our living hope has an evidential based on the resurrection of Jesus. Biblical hope traces all the way back to the empty tomb. Biblical hope is substantial. Biblical hope is built on a strong foundation, namely the resurrection of Jesus. And ultimately... The, Christ, the Christian, I'm going to say the Christmas hope. The Christian hope is these new dentures. The Christian hope is about new creation. And it's about a resurrection body. Christian hope sees beyond this life. Christian hope is substantial. And we were at a service for David, David uh, on uh, the other day there. 
at the, the cremation service and just at the committal part, Neil said this phrase, ensure and certain hope of the resurrection. So our hope goes beyond this life. It's good to have hope in this life. But biblical hope arches this life and goes straight into eternity. And these believers that Peter wrote to needed to be reminded during all their trials and their sufferings that regardless of all that they were going through, they were not without hope. Now forgive me, fellowship people, for telling this story again. I apologize in advance, so please forgive me. But during my driving lessons, I messed up another three-point turn again and again. And we came to the edge of the curb and the driving instructor said, Mr. Nisbet, you are useless, but you are not hopeless. He was a real encourager. These believers that were going through difficult times needed to know and needed to be reminded that there was something within them that had been planted there by God. Living hope comes from him. We don't manufacture it. And this living hope is also part of our experience. And whatever we are walking through, this living hope helps us navigate. And you, you don't need me to tell you that we've not been promised a pain-free life. But as I read First Peter, I saw, I saw three main themes. I, thought, I saw hope, which finds its roots in the resurrection, going back the way. I found trials and suffering, this present life. And I found glory, Everything before glory is subject to weakness and decay. And uh, Peter said to these believers, yes, you are going through difficult times, but you've been birthed into a living hope. And there's an inheritance waiting for you. See, sometimes we have a very, very narrow view of what salvation is. Uh, for many of us, we were probably taught, well, salvation is you believe on Jesus and you go to heaven after you die. Well, that's a very, very narrow view of salvation. The big view is new creation. The big view is the resurrection of the body, to be like his body. I've sometimes wondered whether when I get my new body, if it will still have the scars, which I'm not going to display today, but will it still have the scars that I've got? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know. Certainly, Jesus' scars were visible. I don't know. This living hope helps us navigate the pathway there's a, I, know, I wonder if you can identify with this image on screen. Maybe you can think of something in, in your life that, that this kind of speaks to. It's something that's living and beautiful, but it's springing up out of something really quite hard, quite difficult. At the North Berwick Railway Station, there used to be a, they've mended it now, but on one of the parking bays, the, the roots of the tree were breaking through the tarmac. And I always enjoyed seeing that and maybe parking there sometimes. It's a lovely picture of hope breaking through the hard experience with something beautiful. And maybe that image will, will encourage you and speak to you about something in, in your experience right now so hope helps us navigate through the pathway of the journey of faith in three ways I'm just going to suggest this to you and the first the first one is that hope 
fuels or inspires our endurance. Now, sometimes as a believer, it comes down to enduring, seeing it through. There's nothing bad about that. We're not always walking in faith and victory, uh, clasping a tambourine. In fact, I'm firmly against tambourines. Can I get an amen there? I heard one. An amen. But hope inspires and fuels our endurance. And sometimes as believers, it's a case of enduring. And and if you bump into someone and you say to them, how are you? And they say, well, I'm just hanging on there. Well, encourage them to keep on hanging on, to endure. It's not a bad thing. There's a lovely verse, Thessalonians. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. Can you see the three virtues in that verse? Faith, hope, and love. And he says, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Next slide is something similar about Abraham and his, we always think of Abraham as a man of faith, but there was also a strong hope within Abraham. And it says, this is from Romans chapter four, against all hope, Abraham in hope Believed. If you remember the circumstance, God had promised a son, but there was no son, and Sarah was now way, way past childbearing. But God had said to him, you're going to be the father of many nations. So he continued enduring and in hope and in faith. Sometimes in our lives, the circumstances do not match up with what we believe God has said to us or what we see in his word. And those are the times that we're called to endure and to remain. So that's the the first thought to bring to you is that hope fuels our endurance. The second one is that this living hope inspires or fuels our stability, our ability just to stand in that same place. And it says in Colossians 1, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm and do not move, from the hope held out in the gospel. When I was younger, many, many years ago, I used to play chess sometimes. And you know, I'm not not an expert by any means, but what you find is that many of the the pieces, that, that their main function is to hold their ground, just to stand. Other pieces, they move about a fair bit, like the bishop, he moves around. But other pieces, they stand and they, they hold their ground. And sometimes, in our, in our experience, just to stand is victory. And, and that's the whole meaning, Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God, having done all things to stand, to stand is victory. To hold territory is victory. And this living hope fuels or inspires our stability. It helps us to stand and not be moved. And elsewhere, there's another verse here. Thanks, Norman, from Hebrews. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm 
and secure. It's a picture of the ship. It's anchored. It's firm and secure. Despite all that's happening around it, it's anchored. And that living hope does much the same for us. It anchors us. And finally, because you know that I'm a short speaker, but this is an important one. This living hope is part of our defenses, our defense system, if you will. If I was to ask you, well, where in the Bible does it talk about the armor of God? Well, you say, well, that's Ephesians chapter 6, the breastplate and so on. But interestingly enough, in Thessalonians, there's a slightly different take to what Paul mentions back in Ephesians. And this is one of the little changes that he makes. And it's in uh, verse 8, it's on screen. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love, there's two of the virtues, as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Which part of the human frame does the helmet protect? Protects the head, protects our thoughts. This living hope, this hope of salvation, which is much more than going to heaven when you die. My mom used to say, you got a pie in the sky after you die. Well, that's bad theology. Salvation's a far wider, bigger thing. We're talking resurrection. We're talking new creation. The hope of salvation as a helmet. Protecting our thoughts, protecting our mind. So just to remind us of those kind of three qualities that I've mentioned. Hope fuels our endurance, our ability to keep on keeping on. Because something within us finds its roots in the very resurrection of Jesus. The second thing I mentioned is stability. Just standing our ground. Taking, just taking our stand and just standing there. Even that is victory in itself. And thirdly, our defenses. The hope of salvation as a helmet protecting our thoughts, protecting our mind. So just to wrap this up, here's the verse that we began with. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In the same way that our 10 pound notes or 20 pound notes only have value because of the gold reserves, so our living hope has value because it traces all its way, its, its way back to the empty tomb, to the resurrection of Jesus. Can anyone think of a verse in the Old Testament that we test here? It mentions hope and it mentions a valley. I think Jenny knows. That, yes, the valley of Achor. There's a whole story there, but there's a promise from God in the Old Testament that he would make the valley of Achor into a door of hope. And that's Hosea chapter 2 verse 15. A door of hope. And I was thinking of that verse and this image on screen of the empty tomb. That great big stone that was rolled away. By the way, the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. It was rolled away to let other people in to see that he wasn't there. When you have a resurrection body, stones don't really mean that much. And when I was thinking and looking at this little image 
the empty tomb, I, I thought of that verse in the Old Testament, of the door of hope. And that when the stone was rolled away, hope just came out. Christ Jesus is our hope. And sometimes in life we can place our hope in, in the wrong things. But our hope is in him. In fact, one of the songs that we sing, in Christ alone, my hope is found. It's an important thing. So I'd like, just like to pray for us uh, today and then hand back to Neil. Father, in life we encounter various difficulties and trials, things that come along that we didn't see coming. And we thank you that in amidst of all, we have a living hope, that we've been born again into a living hope and that we have an eternal inheritance that won't rust or wear out. And today, Father, we, we pray, Lord, just for each one of us, think of the people in Ukraine as well who just need that hope. Father, I pray for each one of us in whatever circumstance we found ourselves that we would find that living hope inspiring us and fueling us and strengthening us as we face challenges. And that, Lord, people who don't yet know you would be able to look to us and say there's something different about you how come you are so full of hope father thank you for your promises and thank you for the the gifts of god and we thank you for the gift of living hope and all god's people said that's what they said. Well, thank you for joining us today. A great message from Bill. We hope you've been encouraged. I hope you are thinking through this hope that we are birthed into. And we pray that you have an amazing week. Again, if you uh, are local, we'd love you to join us at 10.30 on Sunday mornings at North Berwick High School. Otherwise, we'd love to hear from you. Just email us if you've been watching and enjoying our services. We bless you and we'll see you soon.